Det var noe første. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I am most grateful to you for your invitation to make this presentation about the role of the RNA, and I'm delighted to be in Iceland for many reasons. One I didn't think of until I listened to you, Mr. President, is that you are one of the few people to pronounce my name properly, which, which doesn't happen in France, so thank you. Secondly, ever since I became interested in European golf, I have admired the loyalty of the Icelandic Golf Association and its support for European events. Most recently, I was delighted to see the club champions of Iceland in Bulgaria for the European Ladies Club trophy. You finished ahead of Austria, by the way. And in Portugal for the European Men's Club trophy. As a member of the EGA Championship Committee, I'm delighted to serve alongside Höcker Birgisson, who is such an excellent ambassador of Icelandic golf. As you know, I served, I had the huge honor of serving as captain of the Roland Ancient Golf Club in the last year. And one of my duties was to make many speeches at the end of long dinners, when everyone except me had a lot of wine and alcohol. So I have the daunting prospect of addressing what is, I think, my first sober audience for a long time. Um, you will understand that the Royal and Ancient Golf Club is now one thing and the RNA slightly different. Um, I will try to describe this to you. Um, first talking about the RNA and what it does for golf and then say a little bit about the golf club, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St. Andrews. But please feel free to interrupt me at any time. This is meant to be an exchange and I shall be happy to answer questions whenever you like. I have strict instructions uh, from your president regarding pace of play and I, I shall try to do as I'm told. Uh, I gather that the theme of your conference is golf as a way of life. And quite frankly, I have never seen a better description of what golf is all about. And it started just like that on the 14th of May, 1754, when 22 noblemen and gentlemen gathered for lunch at St. Andrews and decided to pay five shillings each, buy a silver club for which they would compete every year and form a club which was the St. Andrews Society of Golfers. In 1834, King William IV conferred royal patronage on the club, and the club was therefore called the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. Gradually, that club, without a golf course of its own, I shall come back to that, um, took over some responsibilities for golf. Always, always at the request of others. And if you went away this evening, the only thing I want you to remember is that everything the RNA does, it does it because it has been asked to do it by others. Everything the RNA does, it does with others. No decision is made by the RNA without involving many people from around the world. And so the Royal and Ancient Golf Club evolved over time, took on some responsibilities, I, I will show you. And in 2004, there was a split, organized split, between the golf club, like all your golf clubs, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club, and the RNA group of companies, which has undertaken the tasks, such as running the Open Championship, drafting the rules of golf, etc. So the RNA. The RNA, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club historically, and now the RNA, does mainly three things. It organizes a few championships, it helps with the governance of the game, and it contributes to what we called working for golf in other ways. One thing, part of the legacy, is the Royal and Ancient Golf Club 
is a very international golf club in its making. 45% of members are from outside the United Kingdom, which is a lot. Out of 1,900 members, uh, I think 900 are from overseas, as we are called by the British. Um, and um, so let us talk first about championships, if I can, yes. Championships, well, you all hear and know about the British Open, the Open Championship. Now, first example, this was created by Prestwick Golf Club, as you know. And the Royal and Ancient Golf Club did not become involved in the Open until many years after it was started. The Amateur Championship was created in 1885 by Royal Liverpool Golf Club, Hoylake, not the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. And it is only a, a few years later that Royal Liverpool said to the RNA, please run it. The Boys Championship, created in 1921 by an English major living in Ascot. Between 1921 and 1948, it was run by this gentleman. And in 1948, he turned to the RNA and said, please do it. And then we have created the Senior Amateur Championship, the Boys Home Internationals between England, Wales, Ireland, and Scotland. And we run international matches jointly with the United States Golf Association for the Walker Cup, which is the amateur match between the US and GBNI, the St. Andrews Trophy against the continent of Europe, and the Jacques Léglise Trophy against the continent of Europe, and that is a boys' match. So the championships occupy a major place in the life of the RNA, and of course the Open Championship is by far the most important event because it generates the income which is entirely redistributed to golf in a number of ways, as I shall explain. Apart from championships, the RNA is involved in what we call governance. And again, I stressed, I stressed not on its own, always with others. In three main areas, the rules of golf, equipment standards, and the rules of amateur status. Good afternoon. Okay. And um, there is another part than governance, I shall come back to governance, which is what we call working for golf, which has three main components. What we call sustainable golf. How can golf courses be sustainable? Are we going to stop in Europe and in America throwing water and pesticides and having soft surfaces etc., etc. The answer is yes. The social acceptability of overwatering golf course, apart from the fact that it's bad for golf courses and very bad for golf, is going. So golf courses need to be run differently. And that's how the RNA is helping. Again, at the request of the European Golf Association, which created a golf course committee. And it was fine to create a committee, but somebody had to do the background work. So it turned to the RNA to form this work. Golf development, depending on years, between four and five million pounds are distributed to golf throughout the world for specific project, junior programs, public courses, public practice facilities, etc. And then heritage. Heritage is about creating, which we did, and running the British Golf Museum, which is in St. Andrews, behind the clubhouse. It is about looking after our clubhouse collections of paintings, golf balls, old clubs. Working on film archives, we have 60 years of film archives of the Open Championship. Looking after our championship records, so that the memory of, of championship golf, both professional and amateur, is not lost. Now, briefly um, talking about our governance structure, which I think is um, interesting. In 1897, um, the Rules of Golf Committee was formed. Again, the RNA had nothing to do with the Rules of Golf initially. The first rules, as you know, were drawn up at Muirfield or by Muirfield 
rather by the Honourable Company of Edinburgh Golfers, 1744. The RNA came late and was just asked to deal with that. In 99, the first code of rules, all over 100 years ago, because before that, each golf course or golf club had its own rules. First equipment rules in 1909. In 1920, we took over the running of the Open and the Amateur Championship, 60 years after the Open was created in 1860 by Prestwick. In 1952, and that is quite important, we had the first unified code of rules with the USGA. That is when we stopped the practice of stymie, when you were putting, and if you missed the hole, you tried to miss it on the side of the hole where your opponent was coming from, so you would block his way into the hole, and you couldn't mark the ball. Um, the Amateur Status Committee was formed in 1966. The Equipment Standards, as it is now called, committee was formed in 74. And in 2004, we split, if you like, the club versus what you used to call the external activities, which are now in companies. And that has two advantages. The first is to shelter the members from liability if a decision, for example, on equipment standards, it's challenged by a club manufacturer. We don't risk what we risk in 1989 when Ping sued the RNA, is having to sell our house or whatever to pay for the uh, lost lawsuit. And secondly, it enables us to bring more people into decision-making, people who are not members of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. Um, we... The RNA is um, linked to 137 national federations and other organizations, so it is a governing <coughs> authority, again, as a result of the request and consent of many others. When people talk to me about the RNA, I refer to a quote by Stalin during the war, who was told of the influence of the Pope, and he said the Pope how many tank divisions? The RNA has no tank divisions, and if tomorrow anybody wants to play according to different rules or with <coughs> illegal clubs as we see them, there's nothing we can do about it. So it is very important every day to work on building a consensus, on understanding what other people come from, what they want, etc. The Rules of Golf Committee, which is <coughs> quite important, which, as you know, was formed in 1897, is made of 12 RNA members, but it has a number of advisory members. Now, I'm told that this is how it works. The advisory members are very, very important. And I happen to have served two years as a representative of the European Golf Association before being one of the 12 RNA members. And I can tell you my opinion was much more important when I was a representative of the EGA than when I was one of the 12 members. Uh, these people are very, very important. And then you see that Europe has two representatives, unlike any of the other bodies. We work very, very closely with the professional tours. Um, and I will come back to that when I talk about anchoring the putting stroke. Because we got on very well with our professional colleagues and friends, unlike the USGAs. Um, Whilst the Rules of Golf Committee does not meet a lot, it works very, very hard. There is a very important part of the office that works on Rules of Golf. There is also the Amateur Status Committee, um, which deals with the Amateur Code, which was revised pretty fundamentally two years ago in order to enable more flexibility for amateurs to receive expenses to enter into contracts before they actually turn professional, even though the benefits will be available once they turn pro, etc. Again, as you can see, a lot of advisory members. The Equipment Standards Committee is the third major leg of the governance part. And again, we, we work with the USGA, with the Japan Golf Association. Japan is an important country because of many... Uh, equipment manufacturers being there, and we work extremely closely with uh, the tour people. The USGA is a very important partner. It was formed actually in 1894. The first USGA championship was in 1895. Um, and we have always had a very good relationship with the USGA, 
but we work very independently. In, in, and we have to come to views first and then we exchange, but it's not one party dominating the other. Uh, obviously, the, the United States is the largest golfing market, the largest golfing country, although one day I suspect China will overtake them. Um, the rules review process is something which is very slow and very organized. Everything that is done is very systematically done, always with a lot of involvement from other people, and it's a four-year cycle, so the little rule book which you have finishes, I think, in, at the end of 15, and then in 16 we will have a new rule book for four years. Uh, one of the major part of the rule system is the rules decisions. Uh, I think there are some seats if anybody is looking here. Um, there is, you know, the decisions book, which is very thick, um, and um, this, this is the result of, of quite an intense amount of work. Now, when we talk about rules revisions, you see here this man who is anchoring his putter. Now, you know that there is a proposal which has now been accepted to ban anchoring strokes from the 1st of January 2016. Some questions come to mind. That, is that really important? And why now rather than 25 years ago when long putters first appeared? Well, the answer is because until now there was no consensus to ban this putting stroke. People did not all agree in the main to do so. They didn't think that it was terribly important because they didn't think the champion golfers were using the long putter. And so people think about it, take time, exchange views, and at a certain point in time, people decide, I think we should do something. So the, the, the rule, um, it is going to be 14.1b, you know, in making a stroke, the player must not anchor the club either directly or by use of an anchor point. And then you go into the definition of an anchor point. And before you have a headache, I think I shall show you what you cannot do, which is put the uh, end of your putter in your tummy. Um, you cannot put it and anchor it under your chin. You cannot anchor your forearm or the elbow against your body. Is there anything else you can't do? Yes, there's the, the um, <coughs> further up. You can't do that. But there is still plenty of scope for those who can't putt properly. <laughs> you can try this and have fun. Good luck to you. You can do that, of course, which I think is more sensible. You can do that along your arm on the left and that which Bernard Langer has tried very successfully. So there's still plenty of hope for all of us. Now, um, moving on from the rules, um, briefly the amateur status, which is not something which is as fascinating to many people, but it has served the game rather well because the rules have evolved, more flexibility has been introduced, and yet we have managed to do one thing which the professionals historically have wanted, which is to protect their profession, particularly the profession of teachers. Historically, the PGAs did not want any one of us to start coaching people and take money for our poor advice. So the protection of the teachers, the uh, need for them to be properly qualified and recognized is one of the reasons why the, P the, the PGAs have supported the amateur code. And it has served the game well, as I said. There are those who play just for fun, those who play hopefully for some money, and I hope for a bit of fun as well, although when I look at them, it's not always obvious. <laughs> um, I was saying the code has been completely and fundamentally reviewed. We have one unified code throughout the world and um, we still have issues. One of the important issues to me and to others is 
as you know, when you look at the top amateurs, almost all of them turn professional. Very, very few, I would say less than 10%, ever make it on the tour as successful playing people. Very few of those who are great golfers but not successful playing professionals actually want to be teaching professionals. And in Europe, at least, continental Europe, the, the, there is no expansion of golf clubs such that everybody who's a pro can become a teaching pro tomorrow. So you have a lot of very gifted people, intelligent people, very fine golfers, who are not making one dollar as playing professional and who could be very useful to all of us as club secretaries, as federation directors, or in regular jobs and serve as captains of national teams, captains of county teams, etc. So the ability to transfer professionals back into the amateur status at no cost to them because they're not making any money, but they would if they had a proper job, and they would be able to serve the game in a meaningful capacity, I think is a great challenge for the future, for the benefit of the former professionals and for the benefit of the game of golf. Um, I don't know why I have a slide that comes back to the rules, but um, yes, we are doing, in the rules of golf, we're not just writing rules with others. We are doing, as I said, many other things, such as responding to the queries from golfers, golf organizations, publishing decisions. Um, and we are increasingly working on pace of play initiatives. Now, the game of golf is suffering hugely from the time it takes to, for too many people to play a round of golf. And people are giving up golf or not taking up golf because they say we can't afford five hours, six hours, and so on. Apart from the fact that it's hellishly boring and far more difficult to play slowly than it is when you play at a normal pace. So a number of bodies, the RNA, the USGA, the EGA, are working very hard with the golfers, with the competitors, to try and get them to understand how you move on the golf course, how without any detriment to your performance, you can actually play much quicker. And this is, I think, a key for the well-being of the game in future. And at club level, it's very important to try and improve the situation. Um, one of the things we do with the RNA is to give seminars. This is uh, a tournament administrator and referee school which is run at St. Andrews every year in March. I don't know if any of you have attended that seminar, but it's, it's quite popular. It goes for three days and you can take the rules exam at the end uh, and have a good dinner afterwards. Um, it's, it's, it's quite popular. And now we run seminars around the world and also seminars which are called Teach the Teachers. These people are probably very qualified referees. I actually opened a, a seminar in Thailand last year, and you had very serious rules officials from all the region, Southeast Asia. And you know, we teach them how to teach the rules to junior referees who then coach golfers, etc. So that's the, that's the way forward. Um, we run on-course seminars with the federations always, with, with you know, our, our affiliates. We develop new technology tools. Uh, don't ask me too many questions about these, please, but I'm told they work very nicely. And you can even now pass the exam remotely by you know, plugging in and you can take your rules exam, stage one, stage two, stage three, etc. Um, now we come to a very interesting stage where we find the 34 rules, the thousands of decisions, 100 pages of index only is getting yes, increasingly complex, very difficult to translate in so many different languages. And um, we are trying to see if we could rewrite the rules completely and make them simpler. And that's every generation's dream. Um, there is a little group that's working. If you see this, I don't know if you watch the Masters, when Tiger Woods hit a shot into the water of the 15th, and the ball hit the pin, as you remember, went back left, 
And he decided to take stroke and distance, walk back to the divot mark, and then did two yards up, although it was not that visible on television. <coughs> there was a big hoo-ha about it all. He was eventually penalized two strokes, although he had handed in his card with the wrong score for the hole, rather than disqualified, being disqualified. Now, in that little instant, three rules, separate rules, were involved. The first was the water hazard rule. He should have dropped under rule 26-1A, stroke and distance, dropping as near as possible to the point from which he had played. Not having done that, he breached another rule, which is rule 20-7, as he played from the wrong place, which should have triggered a two-stroke penalty under rule 26-1A. Because he handed over his card, went home, and we only heard at 10 o'clock at night his interview in which he said he deliberately walked two steps up because he didn't want to have the same distance again for fear of hitting the pin once more. Rather precise, isn't it? Uh, the committee took a view, and it was quite stressful, that it had considered the drop at the time because somebody had phoned them and said, you better have a look thought the drop was okay, which given the camera angle and given the fact that the slope was going like that, it was probably okay to drop a fraction behind the divot mark in order for the ball not to drop forward. So the committee decided not to speak to Tiger before he recorded, which they could have done. In light of the fact they had considered the drop and done nothing about it, ruled 33.7 was implemented, which gives the committee, in exceptional individual cases, the possibility to waive disqualification. Because that is a rule which is basically meant to prevent a player from being disqualified as a result of a mistake made by the committee. But the committee made a mistake only in light of Tiger's subsequent declaration to the press, if you like. Anyway, this is quite an unpleasant thing when you run a tournament, uh, although it's marvelous if you're a journalist. Um, and so there is an increasing awareness of the fact that the rules are getting very complex. Many people don't know the rules at all. It's, it's actually staggering how some experienced playing professionals know very little about it, and they're difficult to translate. So there's a project group working on something which would be, I am told, much simpler. Good luck to them. Uh, I think it's very, very difficult, but very interesting if we can do it. Um, so these are the objectives. Um, just the third leg, so we talked about amateur status, rules, equipment standards. There, again, this is a very, very difficult area because we all sit in our armchair and we say, the ball goes too far. Why don't they do something about it? The wedges are too easy to play. Skill has been taken away from golf. What, then they do something about it? The driver allows the ball to go too far. They're doing nothing about it, etc. And at the end of the room, you have the equipment manufacturers with their lawyers, with their physicists, everybody waiting for the slightest mistake to instigate legal proceedings. So um, what we did First of all, we found in the 1990s that we didn't know anything about the science. We relied entirely on what the manufacturers told us and a little bit about the USGA. And so we decided to have our own test um, center in St. Andrews. We decided to hire a very significant man, a, a physicist. And we, at the end of all that, we published a statement of principle, which said basically three things. The first is that we believe that it is better for the game of golf to have one set of rules applying to everybody, i.e. no bifurcation. Not a set of rules for us here and a different set of rules for the professionals. What is interesting is to try and play with the same equipment, the same balls. Otherwise, the diversions will go and go and go 
and we won't play the same game at all, and the governance will be all mixed up, and we think really there are a lot of drawbacks in having different sets of rules. The second thing is, by 2002, we thought the ball should not fly significantly further. We understand golfers are stronger, equipment is better, golf, horses, golf courses are more manicured, etc. But we thought at that time, when we get to 300 yards in the air, it's probably about time we should really do something. And the third point was, if there is any meaningful increase in the distance which the ball travels, then it will be necessary to seek ways to uh, protect the game. So, so we are uh, monitoring the situation, as I will show you in a minute, rather carefully. People still think that the ball is an issue. And this is a project which is ongoing. Uh, we are looking at regulatory options because if the trajectory goes further, if the ball flies further, we may have to do something with the ball. So we are testing balls. Um, we are reviewing developments in club and ball technology. And we are reviewing statistics. But when I mention the ball, it is a very, very old subject. In 1919, nearly 100 years ago, the chairman of the rules committee, the great amateur champion John Lowe, suggested that the power of the ball should be limited in order to preserve the balance between the power of the ball and the length of the holes, 1919. In 1936, Robert Harris, another great amateur, who was chairman of the ball subcommittee, suggested the size of the ball should be increased from 162 inches to 168 inches. In 1970, we tried a compromise size ball, which was 166. The British had 162, the Americans 168, and for several years we tried the 166. Anyway, in 1973, we agreed to have only one ball, which is the ball we play, the 168. But you have people like Jack Nicholas uh, who keep arguing that it, the, the, the ball should be reined back. Now, <clears throat> um, I'm not sure this is a very different, is it? Oh, the thing is upside down. I'm sorry. What is this? Oh. Ah, yes. I think, I think this, no. This is slightly, oh, yes, they move all the time. I'm sorry. What this shows you, I think, is that between 2002, the date of the joint statement of principles and now, the uh, average distance, if you look at PGA Tour and European Tour, hasn't increased hugely. It is between, for, for the PGA, the European Tour is between 285 and 288 yards. Um, and this is two, 230,000 shots, uh, as you can see here, are, are being evaluated every season. And uh, so it's done very, very professionally. Um, you will see again in the next slide that you see the same thing, the same trend. If you look, this is on the basis of handicaps. Above, you have the handicaps under 6, then the 6 to 12 handicap, 13 to 20, etc. And basically, uh, particularly relevant is the better golfers. This is where they are, and it doesn't seem to increase too dramatically. If you look at, again, the average, uh, you have by handicap category, oh, well, I told you I was pretty useless. This is, um, so category four, category three, category two, category one, club pros, amateur championship, sort of high level, and PGA European Tour. Uh, you know, it's, again, this is where we are. And when we think about 300, 290 yards, we must not forget that the bulk of the people who play golf are around this, this distance. And we must not forget that lady golfers must get round the golf course. And I keep playing on golf courses with a handicap of eight, which are far too long, 
I don't use many of my golf clubs, and uh, I could do with certainly six or seven hundred yards less, and it would increase speed of play. So uh, we're, we're looking at a number of things. Um, all I can say, as far as this is concerned, is that we are taking these three areas very, very seriously and very internationally. Nothing, nothing, when you say St. Andrews has decided, St. Andrews decides nothing. St. Andrews is a platform for international discussion with a lot of different people, a lot of different stakeholders on equipment standards. We work constantly with club and ball manufacturers because there is no point in deciding something unless people are convinced that it's the right way forward. Um, I would like now to talk about something else, which is working for golf, which is what we do in another field. And I think, can I ask you quickly, please, um, to go to the other, the other thing? This, it will be quite short. Uh, the other aspects of working for golf, <coughs> like hel helping with development, I think. All right. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. This little building, by the way, as you know, is the clubhouse of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. The Royal and Ancient Golf Club is there and that's all it has. It has a few office buildings in town. The golf course is a public links. Seven courses, public links, run by the Links Trust. The Royal and Ancient Golf Club is one of several clubs in St Andrews. And we have the St Rule Club, the new club, St. Regulus Golf Club, the St. Andrews Club, the Thistle Club, the University Club, and the very revered Ladies Putting Club. They play on the Himalayas. Very, very serious lady putters. And we share limited access to the links with this family of golf clubs. When anybody talks about St. Andrews, the RNA, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club, membership, who's a member, who's not a member, they should not forget that you have this building and to the right of the 18th you have many other clubs. This is a family of clubs. They live together, they play together on public links, they play matches against each other. It's a way of life. We dine together, we have great fun. And I know the British press tells us what we should do, but as far as people in St Andrews, they're very happy as they are. It doesn't mean they're right, but they're certainly quite happy. And so um, this is both the, uh, the clubhouse for the club, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club, but it's also up here is the office of Peter Dawson, who is both the secretary of the club and the chief executive of the RNA. What we do is quite a number of different things. We try to make a little money by running the Open, and quite frankly, we don't make a lot of money because it's increasingly expensive to stage and to run, but whatever money we make, arising principally from media rights, broadcasting rights, we redistribute to golf in a number of ways. So you have all the work that I talked about, about rules, governance, and education, equipment testing and research, coaching, uh, we provide equipment to people, countries that can't afford golf clubs and golf bags and golf balls. We provide greenkeeping machinery. We help with the development of junior golf around the world. We support, as I said, creation of public facilities, practice, practice uh, public courses. We help professional golf. I shall come back to that. We run amateur events and we support many amateur events. Many of the European Golf Association championships would not be staged at all were it not for the support given by the RNA. We help student golf. By, we have over 100 um, scholars to whom we give between 1,500 and 3,000 pounds each. Not a lot of money, but it pays for quite a few championships during the season. We work, as I said, on our heritage and um, we work on golf course sustainability and we uh, provide scholarships and education. So it is quite a lot. This is typically uh, a coaching on rules and education. This is the uh, research on 
uh, equipment standards I was talking about. This is coaching David Howell. Here is in Abu Dhabi, helping the children to play. We uh, also have quite a bit of, in, of work that we do for the handicapped golfers uh, around the world. We uh, provide uh, equipment to children, particularly all around the world, and machinery. And one important thing we do is grassroots initiatives and coaching, sorry, coaching, uh, coaching by teaching the teachers. For example, we, we, together with the PGA, we did a lot of work to coach uh, teachers, for example, in India, who to become better golf coaches, better golf teachers, who were then able to make better golfers out of their own uh, kids. This is the, uh, a check for a public course in Portugal. Uh, we support the European Ladies Tour quite substantially, as well as the European Challenge Tour. Um, and to do that, we, we also have student golf. This is, I think, a picture of the Palmer Cup, which is Europe versus America uh, students. Uh, and this is Bobby Jones with a claret jug. And we, we work a lot for the museum, which we support. And as I said, to try and buy some artifacts and most importantly, in the last 10 years, we've invested a lot of money on this sustainability project. And there is a dedicated website, which uh, I think you can look at, which is www.randa.org.golfcoursemanagement. Uh, and I think this is a very valuable part of our work because it's directly helpful to many people around the world. And we have, for that, we are greatly helped by ambassadors, Hordrick Harrington, Susan Peterson, and our newest one, Yang Wen Chong, who will appear in a minute, hopefully. And there he is. Um, so that is very much what we do as RNA. There is a club, and uh, perhaps if I can take two minutes, I can show you a little video about something which happened to me, which explains why I'm here. Because as a captain, you have to win a medal, and you win a medal by playing one shot, uh, which is not a lot, but it's quite a high-pressured shot. And I thought I would show it to you. Um, it's at 8 o'clock in the morning, which doesn't help. Uh, and this is the driving-in ceremony. So. There are quite a few spectators who normally wish you well, but... Um, uh, so this is my predecessor, Alistair Lowe, and the honorary professional who will tee the ball up. This has been going on for 200 years. Huh? <laughs> and there's a cannon which will be fired at the moment of impact, <laughs> even if it's an air shot. <laughs> yes, without the ball. <laughs> Always better. You would see the backswing is very, very short. <laughs> so close to the team <laughs> that they had to run a bit further, which was good. <coughs> and so the caddy brings the ball back, and I give him a gold socket. And uh, it's a ceremony that takes place every year on the third Friday in September. That's... I don't know how
how it stops. Uh, stop and so, what do I do after that when I recover? We have breakfast with the past captains and their wives and a few guests, and then I play the proper medal at 10 o'clock with my uh, predecessor. And then in the evening, there is the annual dinner where we wear our red coat, which is a red frack, and we sit on a platform and we have 400 people dining. And the outgoing captain proposes a toast to the new captain who replies, and all this is normally quite civilized. And after that, hard work starts, because you go to a number of dinners, club centenaries, club anniversaries, county dinners in, in Britain. Uh, Federation anniversaries, if you are invited. So I went to Australia, Japan, Bangladesh, Sweden, France even, um, strange place, and, and uh, many dinners in Britain. And there was a time in winter when I was not more than two nights in the same place. So you, you really need a bit of top spin. You see? And then in April starts the really the championship season, so you go to the Masters where you have every night either a dinner or a cocktail party or something you have to do. You just can't sleep. And then you go to the US Open, which is fine, and the Open, British Open, you host lunch every day. And, and, and then I went to 10 international amateur events in nine different countries because I want to support the amateur game, particularly in Europe. And uh, um, you sit as a board member, you sit as a general committee member, but you have no executive role. You don't decide anything, which is wonderful. Uh, but you're basically an ambassador. So you have to <coughs> behave yourself. You have to remain sober when everybody else is drunk, etc. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's about it. There is one thing to finish that I thought about our wonderful game that brings us all together. I have been very privileged in my life to be born in a golfing family, to belong to a, an old golf club where kids could grow up and everybody was so nice to us. And uh, I have come to think that the heart and soul of golf is the golf club. It doesn't matter whether it's five holes and ten people or congressional in Washington with golf courses and thousands of members. It doesn't matter. The golf club is the heart and soul of golf. And to every extent possible, we must protect and promote the golf club spirit. This is where friendships are made and renewed, where young kids grow up, when old people are supported by their younger fellows, by their friends, lifelong friends. And it brings together the wonderful human uh, element of golf. And I once found some, a sentence or two which I thought I would leave with you. And it's written by someone who knows a little bit about the game. It reads as follows. It is not the Open Championship nor the televised professional purses that give golf its plasma. It is the friendly matches played on home territory between people paying their dues to support their own links and nurture what has been handed down to them. That is the game's lifeblood. In turn, that trust is passed on to the next generation, intact and solvent. And in this manner, golf perpetuates, carried along on a solid rock of loyalty and affection. Some clubs have a special character that sets them apart. It is not necessarily the quality of the course or the accommodations of the building that distinguishes them. It is more essentially the membership, past and present, and the file of achievement over a period of decades that creates a tradition. And that was written by a gentleman who won the British Open five times, Peter Thompson. And I think that is, symbolizes what golf is about and what golf club life is about, and I think that's why we're all here. Thank you very much.